Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, my co-host, co-founder, heads up CUBE Research. We've got a great, two great guests here, Devin Day, who's the Executive Vice President at SAS, and Chris Devise, General Manager, America's Technology Leadership Team in Platforms and ISVs at Intel, um, which makes all the great compute that we need. Chris, great to see you. Gavin, thanks for coming back on. Hey guys. Thank you. Great to Thank be you. here, guys. Appreciate it. So obviously, Brian, your CTO, came on. We just chatted. You can't get enough of compute. It's like Star Trek. Scotty, more power. I need more power from engineering. So compute is going to drive all the data analysis. We've seen that from, by the way, from quantum on the high end and research down to CPUs, XPUs, yeah. GPUs, all kinds of different versions of compute are coming. Talk about your relationship with Intel and why is it so important for SAS? Yeah, I mean, this relationship's been 25 years in the making for us, right? And it starts with co-engineering, it starts with joint customers, it starts with joint go-to-market. And then from there, you know, you mentioned the, there, there's an absolute need for compute, but there's absolutely a need for the performance of it. And then also, how are we going to help our customers? Because the, the cloud spend is running out the door right now, right? And, and now we're partnering with people like Intel to get efficiency and performance. And it's been, it's been a great ride. Chris, Intel's built on partnerships. Your entire business is about getting that technology in the hands of partners. Yeah, absolutely. So that's just sums up our relationship with SaaS. We have, you know, some of our biggest customers are common, and it's so much better when they can see the TCO opportunity of both of us working together, because they know it's co-engineered, and they know how to co-implement it and, and get the best and easiest result for the best TCO uh, for, the, for their use. You're one of the few companies that was founded before SAS, <laughs> and uh, you guys both were founded in the mainframe era, so okay, <laughs> x86 didn't exist when, when you guys were founded. And of course, so help us understand the roots of the partnership, you said it goes back 25 years. Take us back and when, where did it start and where is it gone? Yeah, so I mean, I can tell you from our perspective that you know, our, our CEO, is, is Jim Goodnight, is very interested in the performance of compute and always has been and had relationships with executives at Intel and through that started talking about the needs that SAS had from a compute and a design perspective. And then that led into, like I said, joint R&D, so designers from their side, engineers from our side working together so that way we can bring the best solution forward. And you know, one stat that's pretty cool there is over this period of time, we're looking at upwards of 90% of our customers are running SaaS on Intel chips. So, you know, they're a huge market leader there for us. What are some of the co-engineering things that you guys have done? Can you share a little bit about some of the benefits that come from that partnership on the SaaS level? I mean, it, first of all, it comes with, <clears throat> we're designing these offerings for our customers. And then we look at optimizing SaaS specifically mm -hmm. to run on Intel chips. We don't do that anymore, right? And then we take that out a little bit further and optimize with our cloud partners to run our software in AWS or Azure on optimized Intel chips. And there's, um, you're obviously servicing a lot of highly regulated industries. Yep. And I'm interested in if there are any um, things beyond, anything you're doing specifically uh, around security, and, and if not, are there any security features that, that are advantageous for the SaaS customers? Yeah, one of the capabilities we've worked on together is uh, uh, trusted domain extensions or TDX. It's, uh, just think of it simply, it's like putting, putting a moat around your castle. Mm -hmm. So it's that extra layer of security uh, in the hardware, and it's, uh, SAS VIA is completely validated and optimized to use this capability where it's available in the cloud or on-prem. You know, one of the things that, we, we always go to these events, and so we're in a market transition, obviously generally AI, everyone's seeing that, and the GPUs are everyone wants, is hoarding them, they're trying to bogar as many as they can. But in the old days, I remember, <laughs> old days when I was 10 years ago, maybe just go back 10 years, the word one-off was a bad word. That's a one-off, we don't want to do a one-off. One-off meant it wasn't optimized, or purpose-built even was like, hmm, purpose-built, better be good. Now we're in a world where everything's a one-off in generative AI. You know, technically it's like these things are being built out, new things are being generated, so that's a phenomenon. And then you have existing workloads that were existing, that were known and deterministic before generative AI. So you now have this collision of deterministic workloads with now non-deterministic features. So this, does that change the um, paradigm on how you handle where to put the workloads and what, what compute to assign to it. What, yeah. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think some of the SAS VIA features that have just been announced. You know, you could use all, all the standard great SAS features that have been around for forever, and now generative AI 
it's become the big yeah. workload everybody wants to look at. So we've worked together to, to fully optimize around a technology we have in our chips, in our Xeon chips called Advanced Matrix ex Extensions. And it basically is a matrix multiply. So it's got a, a big cache in front of a matrix multiply function for each core. So think of it as it's your Gen AI accelerator right next to each core to accelerate it, just like SAS is offering you know, your traditional predictive analytics type of workloads using statistics right next to generative AI. Each of our cores has that capability in it, so you get the best power, the best TCO, the best efficiency, but what it really means for the end user is like, I don't care where my workload or where my data is, if it's running on the Intel chips, I can take advantage of it, it works smoothly and easily. Can, can, yep. okay, so the workload you know, and where it runs is an interesting conversation right now because you know, yeah. early days cloud, lift and shift was the model. Pick it up off-prem, move it in a cloud, all of a sudden that's not performance, costing customers too much, and now we're having very real conversations with our customers about where they're running what workloads and why. And I think part of that is absolutely due to the cloud spend that we're all seeing Right? I see that bill every month here at uh, SAS and I know what we spend across our cloud providers and so CIOs want to be thoughtful now, right? And it, it's a huge part of our message to be able to go to them and say, this was engineered jointly between <laughs> SAS and Intel and these are the benefits that you're getting from it. I'm smiling because you know, Dave and I tend to take on topics that are kind of you know, cutting edge and the front lines, but also boring topics that no one's talking about that's super important, like governance and TCO, right? You mentioned TCO multiple times. These are two very important concepts that are really front and center um, because costs are everything. If you, have a, if you don't have a TCO model that works, and by the way, Half the workloads right now we're seeing, we're seeing and reporting our research don't need the high-end gear, right. right? So can you guys talk about the TCO equation? And then there's a mix and match factor. If you don't need to throttle something up super high and you go with something there, but the general market, that's a bunch of one-offs, generative, needs general purpose computing because they're compute hungry for the SaaS applications. You guys crunch data, yeah. right? So what this general, I don't want general purpose, that's like maybe a bad word, but like there's a market and cost matters. Yeah, one of the things that we're working on is, is having SAS Viya be smart enough to guide our customers on where they should run certain workloads because of the either economic or time impact. And, and as we get better with that with our customers, we're seeing the performance and TCO go down. TCO is important to us because SAS will use all the compute you want to give us. Yeah. So we have customers that are saying, hey, I'm spending this much on SAS. Yeah. And potentially a fraction of it is the licensing cost. The rest is you know, all the power under the hood. So TCO is top of mind. What are some of the TCO variables? are probably the same, energy's probably a big part of it. What's the TCO calculation look like? Because they're going to eat all the compute they can get and they're like always hungry, appetite's huge. Yeah, so uh, power, you know, time, time, how long it takes to, to run, run the, uh, the model. Um, so that's where performance comes in. And then, and then when you start looking at like uh, generative AI models, yeah. You need a different set of hardware to train a multimodal model, a large parameter multimodal model. Uh, you know, everybody thinks of chat GPT. Yeah. You need dedicated GPU accelerators to do that, or AI accelerators. Um, but for most enterprises running AI workloads, if you're doing generative AI, uh, the compute requirements become much smaller. So if you're, and a lot of people are talking small language models or using RAG or you know, all these other techniques, <laughs> Uh, to, to take their data and use their own data, their own IP, make sure it stays yeah. in their, uh, the confines of their walls and not to go train some other model that everyone gets to use. They could use that, it's very efficient, and they get the results quickly. Yeah. So low spend, high performance, great results, easy for the customer to implement. So you mentioned Xeon before, is that really where the focus of the partnership is? Because this, of course there's a lot of discussion in the industry about CPUs and GPUs and NPUs and call them XPUs, uh, all the silicon diversity. Is it the case that the general purpose computing yeah. paradigm works well in, in your world or are those alternative silicon designs yeah. coming into yeah, play? So, so the 25 year history Gavin's talking about has been largely CPUs because that's been our, right. our biggest business, uh, that's been our biggest relationship together. And as we've enhanced the CPUs, we've done more, and it's been from the compiler level up. Uh, very, very strong, deep technical relationship. Well, we've just introduced discrete uh, accelerators. We just announced the Gaudi 3 accelerator. Yep. We're working with SAS to look at how do we integrate that with our products 
So there's alternatives for TCO for the customers who need that additional compute power if they're going to be training large multimodal models. I like the hook example you just talked about the Viya, figuring out where to get the intelligence to place the workload because I think we're going to have a distributed compute environment as well. So what we're watching right now is you can have a spectrum of, of portfolio of, of, of power, if you will, compute power, not, not power power. When say, okay, okay, I got this over here, I got this different configuration over in this side of the cluster, I'll run that over there. So maybe reasoning goes over here. Yeah. Or I want prompt response here, I.O. basically. And, and the user doesn't care, right? And shouldn't care. Shouldn't right? care. Right? The, the economics of it and CIO cares, right? We want that, and, and that translates from compute to storage, because yeah. one of the, the, I'll say, errors we saw early in the, as the cloud expanded was, I need a whole bunch of CPU power, so I'm going to put this on bigger machines, and it was a whole bunch of I.O. and a whole bunch of memory that customer was spending money on that they didn't need. So that part is, is absolutely important for us. And what's the, what's the customer, your customer's configuration look like with Intel? Is it generally like, okay, if you're running X processors on Intel, Xeon, are all the, what, what processors are you guys supporting? And do they buy clustered systems? Are they racking and stacking? What's, the, what's your customer environment look like? It, it's all of the above, right? We have deep partnerships, not only with Intel, but with, all, with Dell and, and a whole bunch of other companies like that. So we're, we're going where our customers are. All of them know how to size them and do the architecture for SaaS. We've, we've done that work over decades. Or as we go into optimized compute within the machine types within Azure. So, you know, one of the things you've heard this week is we believe we have to be able to say yes to where our customers want to run, how they want to run, it, languages that they want to use, et cetera. And, and all generations it. of Intel, right? Yeah. A absolutely, so it helps get the most out of their existing investment and if they choose to go to a new investment of newer hardware, they'll get the absolute most out of that new investment. Yeah, and we, the Dell, just to Dell, by the way, they love, they love that story because mm -hmm. they get the whole AI factory thing going on, yep. which is booming for them. Because look at AI clusters are just a bunch of servers, mm -hmm. okay, with interconnect. That's Ethernet. Yep. I, I <laughs> Sounds like a data center to me. <laughs> exactly right. I've, I've been in, in this industry a while, and, and from an infrastructure standpoint, customers want three things. They want it to be rock solid, they want it to be lightning fast, and they want it to be dirt cheap. And so run your software on that, and I'm happy. That's absolutely you know, right. Let yeah. me do my No one job. says I want a slower processor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> says no. slow and, and slow and more expensive. <laughs> right. No one's calling me with that one. Right. And that's the TCO equation. It's like, nobody wants to go backwards. I'm right? telling it's you, like, the stuff that's sexy is TCO and governance. Those are the two <laughs> factors right now that are the hottest things that we talk about. Everything comes back down to, if you don't get the governance right on your AI, you're pretty much screwed downstream. And then obviously on the performance side, you got to have the right cost structure because the cost envelope's driven by power constraints. And also, why am I spending all this money for this like, gear I don't need? Yeah. Workload doesn't need it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think just to add on to that whole governance part we were talking about, SAS has uniquely put all the models together in one place so you can make sure your data is enhancing your business. And you could use it a way that's easy yeah to improve your business, so you could have traditional models, new gen AI, right next to it. And then underneath that, whatever the hardware is you're running, you're going to get the most out of it because of our long history. Chris, that's a, Chris that is a great point. I want to double click on that, Dave. That's what we were talking about earlier. That is exactly why latency is huge in models. So if your data can't get delivered in, uh, to the compute, yep. it's not factored in, then the whole model could crash. So it's all about data availability, right? So like, I mean, this is just, Basic networking concepts. Move this point A to point B. It's stored here and that's got to move over there to be served. Yeah. So if that's not, if you don't hit the latency number, your AI doesn't really work. Yeah, there, and there's the, the performance and the, the chip side of it with Intel, but it's also, we know data has gravity. And, and we're yeah. trying to talk to our customers about not moving data around nearly as much as they have, either on-prem or within the cloud, because yeah. There's your cost and performance issue. If again. your gover governance architecture is wrong or the overhead of that is, 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 huge. That is huge, it crashes the, 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 the value of AI. Absolutely right. That's what we Raj that. was saying on the stage this morning about moving the data. You don't have to move the data. Single sure. store, right? That's his, I mean, that's we're, his whole wrap. We're I mean, taking a premise on our research right now. We haven't published anything yet, but we're starting to take the position that you should be moving data around a lot faster and that we think there's ways that do new architecture and switches in, in the new configuration where yeah. you can reward from good new networking techniques, massive data movement. But it doesn't cost I, an arm and a leg. I like the, uh, I mean, the, the I, got, I like the derivative of the Einstein quote. It's not his quote, but I apply it. Move as much data as you need to, but no more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, there's truth to that because you run it, you run into the 
laws of physics at some point. And then, yep. Speed of light problem. Yep. Yep. And, and there really is a cost. There's a power cost to moving the data around. So depending, yep. Yep. looking at your compute setup on where the data is, and yep. data gravity does, does become yep. important. So if you want to do it at the edge, how much yep. compute do you need at the edge? If you want to do it at the near edge, if you want to do it at the data center, uh, the, all those factors play in a place. And, and SAS had a great case study on stage around Georgia Pacific yeah. that went through each of those examples of how they do compute and why it needs that data needed to be stay local in some of those cases so the data yeah. so there was real-time access to that data. That was a home run on day one. If you haven't seen that, check that out. Uh, but, did, but speaking of physics, did you hear Pat sort of brought forth his three laws? Pat Kelsinger? Pat Kelsinger, we, we first heard this years ago on theCUBE when he was the CEO of VMware, right? The laws of physics, the laws of economics, and the law of the land, <laughs> right? He's uh, now applying that to Intel's business. But, yeah. you know, he's recycling that, but it's good. Is they're all three you know, immutable. Yeah. No, his, other line, his other line is, if you're not out on the right wave, you're going to be driftwood. <laughs> if you're too far out front, you're driftwood. Absolutely you don't want to miss the wave, but if you get absolutely too far out true. front, you're driftwood. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, timing's <laughs> everything. <laughs> yeah, welcome to this business, right? What, so what's next for the partnership? Obviously, it, we're in, you're hungry for compute, landscape change, distributed computing, architectures are now, seems to be the AI thing, that's, which we, that's been validated. What's next for the partnership for you guys? Yeah, I see it's continuing to work with uh, you know, Intel technology, so more of what we've been doing, you know, latest, greatest processors supported. But as we've talked about Gaudi 3, is we're very interested in working together onto that as SAS enhances and expands its capabilities on SAS via. We would like to do the same with our hardware portfolio and our, uh, you know, Gaudi 3 was rolled out, you know, one and a half times performance of the current uh, uh, best uh, product out in the market. Um, you know, 1.4 times more power efficient. Uh, so a lot of opportunity for SaaS customers to take advantage of that and have some choice in their options, uh, no, where, no matter what they're doing yeah. with their data. Yeah. And that's what we want to provide, ease of use, TCO, and choice. Yeah, your comment on Driftwood is really true, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do with all of our partnerships is make sure we can center a customer in the middle. So do we have a customer that's bringing us a problem that we can go solve with Intel? And, and the, yeah. the partnership's going to be, continue to be anchored there because we don't want to solve problems that no one's asking us to. We need to solve the things that are keeping our customers awake. Uh, awesome. Uh, final question, just to wrap up. Uh, first of all, thanks for doing that. Uh, final question, what is the most important story in this AI world uh, from your, you can wear your practitioner hat or industry hat, you don't have to wear the company hat if you don't want to, if it's too controversial, but what is the most important story in, in this AI conversation that people aren't talking about that should be talking about? Uh, I, I think from our perspective, it is absolutely um, our customers and the market being measured. And, and what I mean by that is, I, I believe we are getting ready to have the summer of disappointment on AI. People are investing large sums of money, right? They're doing a bunch of awesome science projects, but is it bringing them the value of the investment mm -hmm. that they're getting? And, and you know, we talked about it earlier this week of being very measured on stage, making sure we're using generative AI where it makes sense and where it helps creativity, but not trying to always solve the, every problem that we see with AI. So overhyped, it's pretty much overhyped. Everyone's talking about the hype, not the, the meat and potatoes, chopping wood, I mean, carrying water. I think a lot of the hype is warranted, right? It is going to, this is a transformative technology, right? And I think everyone in the market believes that. But, you know, when all you have is a hammer, all you see is a bunch of nails, right? And like, we don't have to try to solve every problem with an AI model or generative AI model. Let's use it where it helps. That, that, that's exactly it. I, I'm right there with you, Gavin, is getting the TCO right. And it's looking at, and I love the French rugby team example <laughs> that you had today, not only because I played rugby in college. Okay, let's uh, hear it. But also because they used all the traditional analytics and then they had the generative AI right next to it to augment how you're thinking about the analytics. And when I've talked to, talked to the best uh, uses of AI today, of people getting results, it's that kind of assist you to help the other tools and how you're yeah. thinking about it. For example, like, hey, everybody thinks it's going to replace uh, writing code. Most software developers aren't spending, they're spending a little bit of their time writing code. The majority of the time they're spending like architecting or, or thinking about the, you know, what's going to happen and nobody likes writing comments. So it offloads some of those to make them better at their core job at the whole software architecture. So in this case with the French rugby team, it showed them how to use all these other tools they have, traditional tools, and made their team better with the generative AI working together. 
So I think it's the how do I use it, yeah. and it, it was done in a cost-effective way because yeah. it was done with their existing tools. Yeah, the productivity and good ROI on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Guys, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Appreciate your, your time and in Intel, and congrats. We love what you do. We need more power, as they said in Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty. Captain Kirk holding us. Scotty, we're, we need more power. We're here Lithium for you. crystals aren't working. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back with more coverage. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.